questions, but for now, we're ready to resume, this, to resume our discussion on malaria, the malaria burden in Kenya, and the fight to eradicate the deadly disease in the country. And I have a very, 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 very um, interesting panel with experienced um, experts who are going to help us break down this discussion. Um, I have in the studio uh, Dr. Lydia Atambo. She's a research fellow. Uh, she's a research fellow at the Amref International uh, University. Joining us virtually, we have Lily Njanga, the Africa Director of Malaria No More UK. And we also have Dr. Andrew Gideko, the Principal Research Scientist at Kemri Kisumu. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. But just before we actually break down uh, today's topic, let, let, let's, we want to invite you to be part of this discussion on social media and also on our SMS lines and, and phone lines. We'll be opening them in a few. We ask you today on our question of the day, malaria is one of the leading causes of death in Kenya. How can we completely eradicate this infectious disease. Malaria is one of the leading causes of death in Kenya. How can we completely eradicate this infectious disease? Remember, you can engage us on the hashtag new normal uh, on Twitter at NTV Kenya at Victor Kiprop underscore. We're also posting this conversation on Instagram and Facebook and you can follow and be part of us, uh, of, part of the conversation. Good. And before we get into the discussion, we have a story that will actually set the, uh, the best for this discussion. 36 million Kenyans are still at high risk of contracting malaria, as that's according to the Ministry of Health, and this translates to about 70% of the population. While COVID-19 pandemic was projected to make a death toll of the account of malaria, the government says the situation is better than forecasted. The frail frame is fighting for fainting hopes. The sting of malaria is one whose pain has been a thorn in the country's flesh, but one which the government seeks to end by the year 2030. The COVID-19 pandemic posed a challenge in this war and was predicted to worsen the situation and interfere with the plan in place to combat malaria. World Health Organization predicted a doubling of malaria deaths if severe disruptions to insecticide-treated net campaigns and access to anti-malarial medicines were experienced through commendable efforts by the government and its development partners. This predicted doubling in malaria deaths was averted. Kenya's malaria distribution is divided into five zones. The ministry says it will distribute 15.7 million nets targeting pregnant women as they are prone to getting infected and raising the mortality rate. The impact of malaria has been felt down to the country's coffers but there remains hope for solutions. Malaria reduces economic growth by up to 1.3% each year, and estimates suggest that workers miss nearly 12 million days of work each year in Kenya. I will also provide the necessary leadership towards ensuring the local manufacture of malaria control commodities like bed nets, medicines, to ensure we sustain our efforts and contribute to the economy. We have pronounced ourselves on this matter that at least the Kenya part of the funding will definitely go to local manufacturers. We also want to appeal to the local manufacturers to up their game in terms of quality, to ensure that the quality that we have of products in our nation are absolutely at best practice globally. Kenya is the fifth African country to launch the End Malaria Council, with the Kenyan Council comprising of 11 members. Helen Aura. And TV. Right, interesting numbers from that story there. 36 million Kenyans are still at risk of this disease. And I think we have even more interesting numbers that we've prepared for you. Um, th these are the numbers reflecting the burden, the malaria burden globally. Over 1 million people die, I believe, every year. 300, between 300 and, uh, to 600 million uh, malaria cases are reported every year. And 61% uh, of deaths um, under five years is, of course, um, uh, um, due to malaria. Uh, globally, we stay globally. Malaria kills a child, one child every 30 seconds. 
3,000, that's, uh, that's translates to about 3,000 children, of course, losing their lives every day to malaria across the world. And uh, we have the numbers for the malaria burden in Africa, and these are from 2017, 200 million cases reported in Africa every year, 403,000 deaths, which means 403,000 people actually die every year due to malaria um, in Africa, and it uh, accounts for 93% of all um, global deaths. Uh, we still have more numbers. 4.6 million cases in Kenya were reported in 2020. That is according to the Ministry of Health. 12,652 people died due to malaria in 2019 alone. And malaria, of course, accounted for three in every 10 outpatient cases in Kenya in 2019. And in uh, the last one, malaria in Kenya, again, to give perspective, is still one of the top 10 killer diseases in the country and is a leading killer for children under five years. Those are the figures that will help us, of course, um, give you a perspective of just how much of a burden this disease is in Kenya. And now, now let me bring in my panelists, as I promised you earlier. I have Dr. Lydia Atambo. She's a research fellow at the Amref International University with me in studio. Joining us virtually, we have Lilis Njanga. She's the Africa Director of Malaria No More UK. And Dr. Andrew Gedeko is a principal research scientist at Kemri in Kisumu. He's also joining us virtually. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. I'll start with you, Lydia. 12,000 people, 12,600 people died from uh, malaria in 2019. This, we, we don't speak enough of these uh, figures as much as uh, malaria is a ban, do we? We don't speak ab about it as much as we should, um, probably because they die in silence. But um, malaria is a disease that is causing um, a lot of harm to the community, both in, um, to their health and to the economy as well. So when we, st when we talk about 36 million people still at risk um, to malaria in this country, I mean, one would, would, would think, you know, it's 2021, we've been having this fight for d several decades. We should be better, should we? We should be better, but, you know, um, I like to compare it to the fight against COVID. So if you're fighting against COVID, you have a spectrum of things you're supposed to do to prevent the infection. Wash your hands, social distancing, physical distancing, wear your mask. So even um, as we are discussing malaria today, there's a spectrum of things we should be doing to prevent the malaria. For example, sleep under a net, insecticide-treated net. Let's treat our pregnant women. Let's uh, spray our houses inside with the insecticides that we need. Let's make sure that our children are protected against malaria. So it's a spectrum of things that together work, to work well in synergy to ensure that we fight this infectious disease. Okay, yeah. all right. Let me bring in Lily, uh, I mean, Lilies at this point. Lilies, on the surface, of course, it looks like just 12,000 uh, deaths a year, which is a huge figure. But we, we, we always talk about, you know, the impact in terms of the people we have lost. We don't talk about, um, you know, the indirect impact, do we? Well, we don't do much of that, unfortunately. And uh, malaria affects us in a lot of ways than uh, most of us think about. And uh, just to mention a few, um, if you look at the health system, uh, malaria takes about 40% in, in some areas. Uh, this means that this is a cost, it's an opportunity cost uh, to caring for other diseases and also the impact that that has on the health system, not to mention uh, the budgetary allocation that will go to that and what the opportunity cost for that will be. If you look at education, we don't think about the number of uh, school days that uh, children miss. And um, if, again, we look at uh, how it affects uh, women and girls uh, disproportionately compared uh, to the other gender, we don't look at that. But it does affect them differently because uh, women are the caregivers uh, most of the time. So they are either sick directly or sick indirectly in the sense that they have to stay home and not go to work uh, caring for the sick ones. Uh, when we look at girls, uh, girls we know uh, miss school because of other uh, cases like uh, menstrual health. Uh, but now when you add the number of school days that are lost uh, due to uh, malaria, then that accounts for much. That's uh, a potential of a child uh, that is lost uh, and maybe forever because they may never reach uh, their potential. Businesses lose quite a lot 
in terms of uh, lost man hours. Maybe we don't pay attention because it will be one person missing today, another one missing next week. But if we put all that in a near, then that will, will amount to quite a lot. So it affects us in all different ways, whether we are in malaria endemic areas or not, we are all affected. Good. And then given this, this, this huge impact that you talk about, do you think we are putting enough attention to malaria? Unfortunately not. I think over time malaria has become that disease, like it's almost a passage of life that uh, we think each of us will get it, will get over it or whatever happens. I don't think we... I think we have come to accept it as part of life, which should not, because malaria is a disease that can be prevented, that we know how to treat, so it should not be a way of life. Uh, we should look at it differently. We should get to that point that we want to do something, uh, but that can only happen if we are all aware about its effects. Good. Let me bring in Dr. Andrew Githeko here. Andrew, you, you are on the, on the front of uh, leading the, the people. Okay, I think Andrew is still trying to join us, and I'm going to come back to you, Lydia, then. Um, she has spoken about how much attention that, that we are not giving to, to, to this virus. But uh, even before we come back to how COVID-19 has impacted, and from where you sit, um, for anyone who is watching at home and they're wondering, then maybe, maybe it's not so uh, bright as we think. Um, do you have any milestones, perhaps, in terms of maybe uh, controlling and management of this disease that we can say, by the way, um, I think we are making progress. Is there hope? <clears throat> well, there's a lot of hope. In the communities, there's, we have more awareness. As AMREF, we inspire lasting change, and we are at the forefront of um, training healthcare workers who are transformative and are impacting the community. For example, we have a team of community health workers who are going into the community, speaking to people, telling them that they need to use their nets, they need to, whenever they have a fever or they have traveled, they need to go in and get their care. They, when they're pregnant, they need to go in and get their malaria preventive uh, mechanisms in place. So there's a lot that is happening. There are milestones we are making. The community is more aware. Maybe we need to be more proactive in the way we, we, we discuss policy and have roundtable discussions about, you know, how we can proactively and intentionally work to reduce the scourge of this uh, infection. Okay, but from where you sit then, having of course uh, watched the way we are addressing this issue in Kenya, what would you say is your biggest concern with the way in which we as a country are approaching um, um, or addressing this issue of malaria? Um, as regards the way the country is affecting, I'll start from up. Um, as regards policy, I think the policies are in place. Um, policy needs funding. As regards funding, I think there is um, goodwill. However, the funding has sort of gone down. We know that the global uh, fund that sort of supports TB, malaria, HIV has gone down, has gone down significantly by almost 50%. And even the Kenyan government um, support to the vaccination program has come down by 20%. So there's a, there's a need to push for um, better funding mechanisms in the country. When we come to the community level, as we said, there are community health workers who are being pushed to go into the community and create the awareness and increase the knowledge that malaria is preventable. And there are things we can do every day to prevent it. For everyday individuals, we have a very good um, program where we support our pregnant women. We have improved the number of women going to our antenatal clinic. So we are, because pregnant women are a vulnerable population, we are able to catch them and, um, and prevent them from getting very high cases of malaria. So there, there are uh, good things that are happening at the different levels. Yeah, but more can be done. Okay. But speaking about funding, by the way, Lilis, you, you're leading an organization, a team that is responsible for not just creating awareness, but also helping perhaps using this awareness to maybe, you know, um, mobilize for enough resources to continue fighting, um, you know, this uh, killer disease. How much of a concern is it to you then that, you know, at a critical time of fighting um, this disease, we see, start seeing, let's say, I think the Kenyan government cut its funding by 20%, I think, and then in the previous financial year, we 
start seeing our other you know, donors, like uh, the global funds, starting to scale down um, on their funding on malaria? Yes, um, unfortunately, that is uh, the situation we are in. Uh, while we should be upping the funding for malaria uh, due to uh, other circumstances, uh, that seems to be going down. And uh, the COVID uh, pandemic has uh, not helped things because uh, uh, a lot of funding, health funding, has also been averted to, uh, to, to, to that. Um, but one thing I can say is that while we are facing such situation, there is... Um, some, some uh, uh, energy being put into that, into uh, creating more resources for funding. And I think uh, let's take the example of uh, the recent um, launch of uh, the End Malaria Council. I think this is uh, an, a very great initiative um, under the, the president, uh, who is also the, the chair of uh, Africa Leader Malaria Alliance. Um, in the fact that the End Malaria Council is supposed to pull uh, together um, other sectors that have previously not participated in the fight against malaria, the business community, uh, corporates, how can they all start contributing? So I think even as much as the funding, uh, the usual kind of funding that we expect has gone down, I think the other efforts that are coming in to try and look for resources in the unusual places that uh, probably we have not looked at uh, before. Uh, but again, it is a situation that um, uh, if nothing is done about, uh, we could see the resurgence of uh, cases and uh, we know a big uh, uh, improvement has been uh, acknowledged uh, in the last two decades. So if we don't do something, keep uh, upping uh, the resources, then we, uh, we risk falling back to where we came from in the 90s. And of course, as we uh, of course begin to take charge of this, um, you know, campaigns to mobilize resources on our own, then there's always been the challenge of uh, if we are over relying on, on donors and what is the potential impact of that in, in our fight. If we are still waiting for approval, we are still waiting for uh, donor one to approve, the, you know, um, the strategy or the proposal that we have given. Yes, uh, that is, uh, it's a serious thing. And, and by the way, uh, we are seeing the donor, the usual donor countries. Remember, they are also facing challenges right now. We have seen um, a country like the UK uh, bring down their international funding from 0 0.7 to 0 0.5. That will definitely have an impact. We, at the moment, we are not sure if malaria will be affected. Of course, it is our hope that it is. It will not be affected. The UK is the second uh, donor uh, for malaria, uh, so there, for there, there is, is is a risk. Uh, but again, I think there is uh, a lot of uh, interest uh, by the by the African governments and, in particular, the Kenya government, uh, because. Uh, there are efforts already being done, one of which I have just mentioned. And uh, what we also see the Kenya government, while uh, across the continent, uh, they're talking about having malaria by 2023. Kenya is looking at bringing down malaria by 75%, according to their current uh, malaria strategy. So there is an effort. And I guess uh, um, with that, comes uh, the interest to, to, to look for funding in, in uh, other areas. And uh, we are seeing that and that is happening. But again, we have to do something. But we can, this can on, we can only get the resources from uh, the unusual quarters if they are aware and they see the importance and they see how this will also affect them positively. Okay, and, and of course, uh, Lydia, part of the reason why this, some of those donors are cutting their funding, especially the ones from uh, government to government grants or, 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 or donors, uh, I mean, um, donations, is because they're trying, they also have, a, um, I mean, a whole pandemic of their own to fight. They're trying to get vaccines for their population. And again, th that brings the question, is there an unseen COVID-19 hand that is, of course, uh, affecting the way we are fighting malaria? COVID has affected everything. COVID has affected, has caused us to fall sick, has, has made some of us to unfortunately lose our lives, has affected the economy, and as you're saying, has affected funding. Um, unfortunately, what we are also seeing is that um, when we started the COVID fight, even in Kenya, 
there was a lot of talk about social distancing and physical distancing. So across all the conditions that we, we, we manage, HIV, TB, hypertension, cancer, there was a reduction in the number of people who should be coming in for their normal clinics. And of course, that affects follow-up, affects um, uh, outcomes of the disease um, in the patients. So what we are saying is that COVID has affected not only malaria, but all other diseases as well. It's almost like we, are mo we had made certain steps, and now we have moved back. Okay. So... Lilies, from an advocacy point of view then, can we have, uh, afford to be distracted at this point? No, we cannot, because uh, malaria is not waiting. <laughs> it continues, even as we deal with COVID, it is not, malaria is not giving us a break to attend to other, to other cases. But I think there is something that malaria can learn from the COVID situation we have seen a lot of solidarity and everyone coming together what if that similar solidarity can come to malaria so while we see a lot of negative impact uh, from covid i think there is uh, something that we can also learn we need to get to that point of solidarity for malaria uh, to really uh, get moving. You have seen how that uh, working together all around the globe, not just uh, here okay. within the country. And uh, we, we have seen researchers, everybody coming to, to put in uh, what they can. And I guess that is why we now have a vaccine for, for, for COVID in such a short time. So if we all can take that example of, of, of uh, solidarity and put it in malaria, I think we can move forward. So while COVID has impacted us uh, negatively, um, it, the, the health system that is, I think there is a lot that we can, we can learn and take forward. Okay. Lady, I'm going to come back, back to you. It's, is there a chance we can, you know, sustain a very, very aggressive fight against COVID-19 without neglecting all these other major situations we have. We have TB, we have HIV, AIDS, we have malaria. As my colleague has aptly said, it, it needs focus and concerted efforts that, that we, we work together in solidarity to know that before COVID, there were all these other things. And after COVID, there will be all these other things as well. So it needs intentionality in the way we, we will work together to fight not only those other conditions, but malaria as well. Okay, yeah. okay. All right, let, let me come back to you, um, Lilis. You, you, you're running a, a campaign, and if I think uh, we, we can go through it, there's a campaign for young people, by young people, to end malaria. Let's have a look at what Malaria No More is all about. Malaria. Won't let you steal from us anymore. We are the generation that can end malaria. Malaria, we are too strong for you. We're too bold for you. We are too fast for you.
of course, Lilis will be telling us about, more about this uh, campaign in Africa led by young people and African celebrities just trying to create awareness about malaria. But I'm told we are now um, able to engage Dr. Andrew Githeka. He's a principal scientist at Cambry. Andrew, if we have you, uh, let me just bring you into the discussion to where we've, um, we've um, the far that we've gone. From a research perspective, um, in trying to, of course, control um, this, 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 uh, this disease, um, in the rural areas during COVID-19. What has been your experience like? Okay, I think, I think we're still trying to find Andrew. Um, all right, Lilis, let me just come back to you before we go for this very quick break. What have we just watched in that video? What is it about? Yes, th thank you very much. Uh, so what we have just seen are young people across Africa. Uh, those are different artists um, from Nigeria, from Kenya, from uh, Rwanda, from South Africa. So it's all uh, young people unified ac across the continent to take action. And this, the campaign is uh, titled Draw the Line Against Malaria. And it is under the Zero Malaria Starts With Me movement, where we say that uh, it starts with me. And the youth are not being left behind. They are doing something about it. They want to be part of it. And the youth in Africa are our biggest resource. 74% of the African population is under 35. So this is really an untapped uh, resource uh, for the malaria campaign, for the malaria advocacy. And it is um, a resource that uh, we are looking to advance uh, in uh, creating awareness uh, in uh, ensuring that uh, we are all moving towards this. Um, and what they're doing there, I'm sure you saw the different lines and all that, all those are, are really a representation of uh, solidarity. Uh, each of us drawing a line, uh, putting it together to really uh, make a pattern uh, that can signify this, the solidarity that uh, can actually come out of all of us working together, uh, the young people leading, uh, the young people moving forward, and all these, uh, it's, it's really going to be moments um, uh, of such engagement. Uh, we are expecting this to run uh, all the way um, until up to uh, the June uh, Malaria and NTD Summit that is going to be taking place uh, during the, uh, the Commonwealth Heads of State Summit taking place in Kigali. And uh, from this, it, we will uh, we will ensure that uh, the heads of state across Africa continue to make to keep and their commitment uh, of having malaria by 2023, bringing down malaria by 90 percent by 2030. And uh, this is the the African youth, the African young people, calling on their leaders and to asking them to translate this commitment, this promise, to action. Okay, Lilis, and, and of course, being a very um, important cog um, and, a, and a, um, a key component of our population, most of, uh, of our population currently is a comprises of very young people, do you think we have taken too long to bring them into the fight? Yes, 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 I think we have, but the, the good thing is that uh, we are now on it. Uh, we can't, we, there's nothing we can do about the past. There's nothing, there's nothing we can do at all about it, but there's something we can do about the present and about the future. And uh, there is, um, uh, it has been proven that malaria can be ended in a generation. Looking at the progress that has been made in the last two decades, malaria can be ended in a generation, uh, within a generation, and the youth are actually that generation that uh, can end malaria because they have the opportunity to. If we continue with the kind of progress that we are making and ensure that we don't lag behind in any way, uh, malaria can be eradicated from the face of the earth by 2050. Okay. And the youth are the people that can do it. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Lilis. And of course, this discussion continues. The challenge is how can we sustain the fight against malaria? And in the, we have to go for a quick break. We ask you to keep engaging us on social media. Hashtag new normal at NTV Kenya at Victor Kiprop underscore on Twitter. You can also follow the discussion on Facebook and on Instagram. When we come back from this break, we'll be talking about the malaria vaccine that was launched in 2019 and also other challenges, including our bodies actually becoming resistant to some of the antibiotics that we have currently in the market. Don't go anywhere.
Yeah, back in studio, the conversation about malaria and how we are eradicating it in Kenya continues. Let's talk about vaccines now. And in September 2019, Kenya became the third country in Africa to roll out the first malaria vaccine after Malawi and Ghana. Speaking during the launch in Homa Bay County, the 10 CS, uh, Cicely Kariyuki, said the milestone would help reduce malaria infection among children under the age of two. New life saving jab is another blow against malaria as Kenya fights to reduce the number of deaths caused by the disease among children. <laughs> Health CS Sinikayoki launched the rollout of malaria vaccine in the country as Kenya joined Ghana and Malawi in efforts aimed at reaching 360,000 children per year across the three countries. Malaria continues to be one of the top 10 causes of death in our country. It continues to be a leading killer of children below the ages of five. Global data show that malaria kills one child every 30 seconds and about 3,000 children every day globally. The fight against malaria has had positive milestones, the latest being the vaccine for children under the age of two. It's a four-dose vaccine that will be included in the routine vaccination for children. For effectiveness, the children will receive the vaccine at six months, seven months, nine months, and the last job at two years. Those with the children that age and are present here to become the champions of this vaccine so that you speak to your colleagues to be able to bring the children to the health facilities. The vaccine which will be offered for free in public facilities will be rolled out in eight counties, namely Homa Bay, Kisumu, Vihiga, Migori, Siaya, Busia, Bungoma, and Kakamega. Globally, over 61% of people killed by malaria each year are children below the age of five, hence the push to have additional preventive methods for children alongside the already existing measures like use of insecticide-treated nets. Tests done on the vaccine has shown that it can prevent the infection of severe malaria by up to 30% in the 6 to 24 months age group. Hence, this gives hope in saving the lives of children in Kenya, especially those living in the lake region where the condition is endemic. Eunice Omolo, NTV. We asked you earlier to be part of this discussion on social media using the hashtag new normal on Twitter at NTV Kenya at Victor Kiprop underscore. On our question, we asked you, malaria is one of the leading causes of death in Kenya. How can we completely eradicate this infectious disease? And I think some of you have been sending feedback. Humphreys Kitagwa says there's a vaccine used in South Africa. It has been used for a very long time. Why can it be used in Kenya? Thank you, Humphreys. You'll be getting responses in a short while. Karuri, Karuri he says just use nets which are medicated make sure you get tested and finally finish your dose anopheles mosquito hainanguvu asante sana karuri um do we have some more yes the last one we have siox mass he says mbunje sisindani i think that is in reference to uh the mosquito nets that we used to use when we were young and i think are, being, are still being used right now to um fight uh, this malaria disease but let me come back to you doctori in, I think um, in 2019, mid-2019 is when Kenya was selected to be part of uh, those three countries in, in Africa, I think Malawi and Ghana, uh, those piloting this vaccine program. Why did we at this point decide to go uh, the vaccine way? How did we get to the use of a vaccine for against malaria? So I'll just go back and sort of tell a story leading up to where we are right now. Okay. So malaria is, has two main players, the human being and the mosquito. So a huge factor as to why a lot of this focus is in the sub-Saharan countries is because of the climate. The mosquito thrives in our climatic areas. So, so in the prevention of malaria, we need to focus on these two entities. So as regards the mosquito, um, a huge way of preventing proliferation of the mosquito numbers is to reduce, is to improve the way we store our water. You know, sometimes we just leave dams or water collection points that are open. The mosquitoes multiply in there. So that's the first 
uh, line of where the mosquito starts, and then the female gets pregnant and is looking for food. So where does it go? It comes to the human being. Unfortunately, it sort of is attracted to the pregnant women and the children. And these pregnant women and children are immunologically compromised because of, of the fact that age is there and the women are pregnant and they're carrying a baby. So when the malaria affects them, it, it is more severe or more impactful than the rest of the population. So what happens is that we are saying, I can't protect myself in isolation. I can do everything I need to do to prevent it, but if you don't use a mosquito net, if you don't do the preventive measures, the mosquito will bite you, carry the, vac the parasite and bring it to me. So that's, we are, that's why we are saying malaria prevention begins with you. So after the mosquito has left the water point, it comes to me, it bites me, it goes through the various cycles in the body, of course causing disease in me, and then comes into the bloodstream. So the pregnant mosquito comes and bites me, and then me, as I'm having fun outside uh, at night, they like biting at night, and I haven't worn long clothes, or I haven't put mosquito repellent, then the mosquito will bite me. And that's how the mos malaria infection is propagated. That's why we are saying, uh, don't be out very late at night, or if you're out, wear long clothes, use mosqui mosquito repellent, or when you're sleeping, use a net. But if you happen to get infected, then please use an anti-malarial drug. Now that's where the problem starts because most of us, we get a fever and automatically think that it is malaria. Um, as it is, fever can be caused by so many things. It can be a bacterial infection. There are so many things that can cause fever. But um, behavior-wise, we have seen that once someone gets a fever, they just go to the pharmacy and say, give me dawaya malaria. And because the fever of malaria is cyclic, so the okay. fever goes up and then goes down naturally. So you take the anti-malarial and then the fever goes down and then you say, ah, I feel better. And you stop taking the drug. So because of the inconsistent use of the anti-malarial drug, we've started seeing a lot of resistance against the anti-malarial drugs. If you're as old as I am, then you'll remember names like Prima Queen, Fancy Da, all those old drugs that we used to use against malaria. What happened to them? We stopped using them because we have sort of misused them and they're not, they not able to protect us anymore. So in fact, the only drug that we sort of have that is protective right now is the atemicinin family, which um, can be the oral or the intravenous one. So when you have the very severe one, we give you intravenously. And when you have um, just the mild form, we give you the coatem tablet. So... In our fight against malaria, we have sort of let go of all those anti-malarial drugs. Most of them don't work. We are left with this one line. And um, we still take anti-malarials and then stop. So there's still resistance that is brewing. So um, at policy level, what can we do? What can we do to prevent the malarial um, infection from going on? Apart from these other preventive factors that we are saying, use a net, mosquito repellent, the next obvious thing might actually be a vaccine. And that's where the vaccine discussion comes in. And we are saying that once we vaccinate the vulnerable population, which is the child, we've seen that the vaccine is targeting children under two because we've said one child dies every two minutes. We've been talking for you can count the One number hour, of children. minutes now. I exactly. Mm -hmm. So children have died in that pocket of time. So we are saying let's target the most vulnerable population. And that's why the, the vaccine is targeting sub-Saharan countries, one. And that's why the vaccine is targeting our children under two, two, because they are a vulnerable, vulnerable population. So what we are saying is that um, although the vaccine efficacy is at 40%, mm -hmm. which someone can say is not... Sufficient. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, sure. it's not sufficient, but it, it plays a very important role because it means the future is vaccine. So that, in fact, the, the future hopes, the malaria strategy says that we hope that the next vaccine efficacy will be at 75%, and hopefully we shall one day have a vaccine that can protect, protect us 100%. What also happens is that the malaria vaccine sort of 
has so many life cycle phases and has so many presentations antigenically. So it's very hard to target it. So even now, 45, uh, the 30 to 40 percent efficacy is very good. And that's how, why the vaccine discussion came in. And that's where we are as a country and as a globe. I'm going to come back to you about the vaccine just briefly. But when we talk about uh, our bodies becoming resistant to some of these drugs that we use, uh, Andrew is ready to join us now. And Andrew, uh, she has spoken about our bodies being resistant to the anti some of the antibiotics that we have in the market. But that's not the only resistance we, that we have, right? We have we've heard of situations where the mosquitoes themselves become, you know, resistant to let's say the insecticides that we use in our nets and that we use in our houses to spray them. Talk to us about the, the, the battle against malaria from uh, the front line of our research. Okay. So if, if you look at the history of malaria country in Africa, uh, you go back to the 20s in South Africa, there are very good records of the use of quinine. Uh, then in the 1940s, they, they discovered a synthetic a form of quinine, which is chloroquine, that was uh, used very successfully in some places. It was used for prophylaxis and, of course, treatment of malaria. And uh, this drug continued until the late 70s, and then the parasites developed resistance. They, they, you could take the drug, and within a week, the disease was back, and actually, people were dying despite uh, taking the drug. Then um, in the mid-80s, uh, after a lot of uh, quarrels between the policymakers as to the efficacy of Crocky, they introduced uh, the SP drug, uh, sulfidoxin perimethamine. And we knew that drug had about five years. It was the process was going to become resistant within five years. So, uh, and that's exactly what happened. Uh, by the end of uh, the 80s, 90s, uh, the price had become resistant. And then, uh, fortunately, there was the Chinese drug at uh, which was later uh, improved to call it the at uh, combination therapy. Okay. Uh, but still, we were worried because we know the history of the parasite. The parasite will be developed resistance. So the policy at that time was based on chemotherapy. And that is a, a quick treatment of the patient uh, uh, and so forth. But because the drug was resistant, this policy wasn't uh, very functional. So then they decided, well, we need to do some form of vector control. And, and they had found out that in the Gambia, uh, there was some people who were using bed net on a large scale. Uh, it was a clear culture that once a woman gets married, she must take with her to her new home a bed net. And it was shown that uh, those people who were using bed nets were protected against malaria. So it was then decided, well, this is cheap. It can be done. And uh, at first, it, the pregnancies were uh, distributed to pregnant women and, and uh, young children. Uh, and they were treated with insecticides. Uh, but we knew the parasite, will definitely, the, the, the mosquito now, will develop resistance to these insecticides. So, uh, and this is what we started seeing after about 2010. Reports started coming in. The mosquitoes are resistant to uh, the so-called pyrethroids. So now we are in a panic. What are we going to do? But research continued. And uh, later on in the mid, uh, say 2015, 2016, they came up with a new combination of insecticides, and this is called the PBO net. It has pyrethroids and what, what is called a synergist. Now, this one kills 100%. If, if, if you use the ordinary insecticides 
you get about 70% intact. But 30% of the mosquitoes will survive and continue transmitting. But with a new net, PBO net, it has 100%. We're also uh, looking at what is called IRS. Uh, that is in, uh, indoor residual spraying, not with a peripheral, but with a different type of insecticide. We've been using what is called organophosphate. And it's extremely effective. In places like Homa Bay, malaria has dropped from about 20% to about 1%. And we are not finding mosquitoes. Some mosquito species have been totally uh, eliminated. Uh, so in Camry, our job is to uh, look at the tools that are available, test their efficacy, monitor them, uh, uh, because uh, it, it's just normal that parasites would have resistance. That's okay. not news. So we need the mosquitoes. Okay. So, but yeah. briefly then, given the way uh, you, you, this, this, um, this issue about resistance keeps coming back on both sides, then does, what does this speak about the importance of research and ongoing research by the continuous research with, um, with how we can continue fighting malaria? Uh, uh, of course, research holds the key to malaria control. Now, some tools are, are very good, others are not so good. The vaccine uh, is the ultimate weapon. If you can get a good vaccine, that will be the ultimate, uh, because it's cost-effective, it's cheap. They are, you know, we already have the logistics, we know how to supply it and give it, that's okay. Then there's some protocol of uh, genetic control. It's very tricky and very complicated. But it's a dream, some something in the sky, but the researchers assist and continue examining things like genetic control. The other one, which we have failed to do, it's very sad, is to improve our housing. Mm. We in Kemu have shown that you can convert a village house into a deadly mosquito trap. By reconfiguring that house, you can force mosquitoes to enter into the space between the ceiling and the roof and kill the mosquitoes there before they enter the house itself. You have to improve the windows, you have to improve the doors. You know, we used to live in mud house touched roof houses. Now people are building palatial homes. You see them on newspapers and TVs. Nairobi. Those people living in Muthaiga and so forth were probably born in a village where they had an ordinary Mabati mud road house. Now, they are living in 10 bedroom houses, swimming pool. We can do it. We can redesign our houses, simple, cheap village house, and, and, and put barriers that can reduce the entry of mosquitoes by up to 80%. Okay. Then the bed net will reduce the remaining by another 80%. Okay. Then the indoor spraying will reduce whatever is left by another 80%. That is within our feasibility. Thank, thank you, Dr. Gideko. We That's the route we have in China. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. We, we're about to go for a break, but let me bring Lilis. Um, I mean, Lilis, if you've had the discussions between uh, what Lady has said and what Dr. Gideko has said, uh, it's, it's all about they're talking about how the vaccine is actually the ultimate, perhaps the ultimate solution to this. And um, from the advocacy bit that you are leading, is this something, uh, is, is the vaccine or awareness about the vaccine something you have incorporated um, in, your, in your campaign? Yes, it is something that uh, is part of it. It is the future as uh, you, you've just had uh, that research is really a way to go. And uh, I know around the world there is more uh, research still going on on, uh, other, on other vaccines, but for malaria, looking at a different uh, uh, different aspects of it. And uh, right now there is even learning coming out of the COVID vaccine that is contributing uh, uh, to the malaria uh, vaccine. So it is part of it because once uh, that the vaccine starts being 
pulled out, then advocacy communication has to come in because people have to be aware. Uh, we have seen in, in, in uh, cases before uh, on other vaccines, uh, peop there being myths uh, surrounding that and uh, the vaccines not being taken as they should. So that the uh, communications advocacy will always go hand in hand with the technical side, uh, because once we have that developed, we need people to be aware of it. We need people to trust it. We need people to know how to use it, where to get it. So all that will have to be part of it. And it is part of what we shall continue to do alongside other uh, communications and advocacy parts of our work. And of course, in the past, when every time we try to introduce a vaccine uh, or any drug, the community always have, you know, they are all, um, you know, uh, some bit of skepticism. Uh, there are, some of them are a bit reserved. And then there's an element of fake news going around. Oh, this one is about to, you know, to sterilize you. And it's about birth yes. control and all that. How do we manage this, these issues? Yes, you're right, you're right. And uh, I, I think one of the ways, and going back to this resource that we spoke about, the youth, I think the youth can really help us. Remember, the youth are the ones on the digital space. So they can help us quell those uh, mis in that misinformation. They can help us drive the right information. They are the ones with uh, their networks in the communities, uh, even in the rural areas. Now we see a lot of youth networks, even in the rural areas. Uh, so I think this resource that we have talked about can really help us because they are all in the right platforms that uh, can help us uh, to, to push forward that uh, kind of information. That uh, look, this vaccine will help you this vaccine is not here to sterilize or to bring down uh, the population or anything like that. No, this vaccine is here to help us and is here to eradicate malaria. So I think this is something that we'll continue to do. And I think we'll continue to count on our biggest resource to do that, the youth. Thank you, Lilith. I seriously want to go for a break, but I think Lydia is seriously smiling here and she might have something to say uh, with the challenge of awareness in, in communities. I think awareness is the key to to most of this, um, to, to, to winning this battle. Awareness that protection starts with me, that if I don't protect myself and do what I need to do so that I don't get the malaria, then I'm not protecting you. And the awareness that the vaccine, of course, has its challenges and side effects, but it's the future. It's the way we will um, prevent deaths and, and save our babies and our pregnant mothers. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much, lady. Of course, a very interesting discussion with my panelists here regarding the burden of malaria in Kenya and how the fight or the ongoing fight against it, um, how it can be stepped up in the country to ensure that we eradicate um, the this deadly disease of malaria in Kenya. And for now, I think it's time to take a quick break. We, of course, urge you to stay with us, be part of the discussion. We asked you earlier on our question of the day. Um, all right. Okay. I think we can, we can go for a break right now. But once we come back, then we will be we'll try to look at what you've been uh, to, telling us on social media. Don't go anywhere. We have spoken about the the situation about of malaria in the country. Spoken about the vaccine and where the future is. Then how do we sustain the fight because we still have this sustainable goals development making sure that we eradicate malaria by 2030 the kenya malaria strategy um, aims to reduce incidences by 70 percent by 2023 how do we sustain the fight to make sure that we, we stay these goals are in sight yeah so that's a very important question so as we keep focusing on the curative curing the ones who are sick we need to still look at the preventive and the promotive aspects so that we are pushing from down and also from up. So we will keep training our community health workers as AMREF so that we have transformative healthcare leaders across the country. We will keep expecting everyone to take responsibility, do what you need to do to protect yourself from malaria because when you are healthy, then you keep your neighbor healthy as well. And in this case, when I say neighbor, I'm sort of alluding to pregnant women and children because they are the most vulnerable. And from the top, the healthcare leaders will keep um, developing the vaccine, will keep pushing for financing, will keep developing policies, will keep looking for partnerships. As my colleague alluded to, 
private public partnership so that we create a network that is committed to ending the scratch that is malaria. So it is Mimi Nakilamtu. So the, the fight begins with me, as it were. Yeah. So working together is what you're working saying? Working together. All right. Let me bring in Dr. Andrew um, Gideka here. Uh, Dr. Ari, um, she has spoken about um, the role that all of us have to do. But I, I still think that the bureaucracy between, you know, the donors and the government before all these things trickle down, before the vaccine comes from, you know, um, the manufacturers to the government and to that person who is actually waiting for it in the village, even as we, they wait for this uh, research and vaccines to come through, what can they do on a personal level to protect themselves from malaria? Okay. Let's understand uh malaria control it's a big malaria is a big disease and kenya by itself even africans by themselves may not be able to contain it as at this stage of economic development so it's been taken up by those people with advanced economies as part of what is called the global health uh, program because like uh, COVID-19, if your neighbor has COVID, then even you are at risk of COVID. So uh, some things can be done by governments. There are other things that can be done by households. Now, if you ask somebody who earns $2 per day, that's maybe or let's say even 500 shillings a day to buy a net that is worth 7,000. And then, you know, there are six of them in a house. That's a pretty tall order. It's not going to happen. That's why, but then do we let them suffer? No, ethically it's not correct. Politically it's not correct. Economically it's not correct. Something has to be done. So the government will put what it can into mosquito control, malaria control, and, da, 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 and then we shall go to our partners. Before we used to call them donors, now we call them partners, and we say, can you help us drive this towards this expectation? Most of the time they say yes. OK, we'll give you uh, $3 million for TB, for malaria, and for HIV, and so forth. So that will continue for some time. Until our economy, our GDP now is what? $1,700. We are aiming at when our economy gets to about 5,000 GDP, then we can afford to supply whatever is required, made with bed nets, drugs, and so forth. So for now, we need to keep our economy growing at about 7 8%. All these other side shows you hear from people are not helping towards uh, uh, growth. So we need to get our economy going quickly so that we can spare more money for health and, and, and other sectors. Okay. And then... Then one more thing, let me say this. Uh, in the decision-making process, you don't have the people with the knowledge and the skills sitting at a big table. It will be the administrators, the politicians, and very few technicals. So the decisions then are, may be made on the basis of economics or politics, but not... not no, a little emphasis is based on the, on, the, on the true data. So we need to get more scientists, more health experts sitting at the high table to advise the policymakers and the politicians on how to, uh, uh, you know, distribute the, the national kick. Okay. Thank you. Thank so you. Those are the things we need to do. All right. Thank you. All right, and, and I think before I get less, let me just get later to touch on that. He's spoken about the need to actually have health experts to sit at the, and, and, and use data and make data-based decisions when they are funding as opposed to maybe political reasons and all that. 
and, and, and he couldn't have said it better. I 100% I um, agree with what he's saying, that we need more science-led decision-making at the top level that is rational and practical at the ground, and it's still feasible so that we are not overspending on things that do not add value. So we look for easy, affordable ways of managing the different conditions that we are facing and also malaria. But we do need the right people around the table. Okay. Yeah. And finally, Lilis, Dr. has spoken about the challenge of underprivileged households, that if we wait for those people to buy nests for themselves, they prefer to, you know, buy food first before they can remember to buy these uh, drugs and, 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 and nets then. Uh, that means we need all the help that we can get, either from donors or from government. How do we move this uh, forward, especially at a time when we don't seem so... Uh, focus on that and we are starting to cut on funding. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, it, it is true that uh, malaria takes a very big uh, uh, part of the of household income in endemic areas, uh, up to a quarter, a, a quarter of, uh, of, of the income. And uh, sometimes it's quite um, uh, difficult to decide, do I uh, take, do I put food on the table? Do I buy the mosquito net? But the good thing is that uh, we have a lot of uh, distribution of mosquito net by government going on. But I think, and I'll go back to what it is that we can do. I think the best part is to prevent this. And uh, this is a disease that is preventable. Uh, there are a lot of measures that we can do. But it needs to start with us. We need to feel a personal responsibility, whether affected directly or indirectly, um, to take action. Because the donor funding will not always be there. Government priorities will, will they, they, they are competing. So we cannot be sure. Uh, last year, uh, around this time, we didn't expect COVID to, uh, to take the kind of priority it has taken, but it has. So there will always be competing priorities. So it needs to start. We need to take a different approach, all of us, uh, by taking action, by doing something at an individual level, at a community level, and at whatever level. And we can only do that if we create that sense of urgency and uh, looking at how we are all affected. And uh, it can, uh, if we do, if we take action, we can see the positive impact at the health level, educational level, our businesses. So it needs to start with us, and we need to have that point of urgency that uh, need to take action because malaria is preventable and is treatable, and we can move forward to eradicate it. Okay, thank you very much, Lilith. The malaria is preventable and we can eradicate it. And I think that brings us to the discussion that we had today on the malaria burden in Kenya and just how exactly we as a country, with support from partners and donors, we can eradicate uh, this deadly disease in the country. Special thanks to my guest today, Dr. Lydia Atambo, a research fellow at Amref International University. Lilith Njanga has been joining us um, um, virtually. She's the Africa Director of Malaria. Area no More UK, and Dr. Andrew Giveco is the principal research scientist at Kemri uh, Kisumu. Thank you very much uh, for your contribution, ladies um, and gentlemen, to today's show. And that brings us to the end of this discussion today. We will be seeing you again 